Hey everyone, and welcome to Berlin in Germany. Today's the 19th day of our epic European adventure, and we're going to explore all this city has to offer. We're going to start the day off by doing a walking tour around Berlin by a company called Walkative that was booked via Guru Walk's website. Link is in the description below. Um, just to explain what we're going to be doing today, it's called the Welcome to Berlin Tour. Uh, I'm going to bring you on to like, most of the main sites and landmarks of the city. It uh, should be about three hours long, it depends on how fast we walk. Uh, I'll try and give you a little break in the middle. Um, not so hot today, so it might be all right. Don't need to hide in the shade. First occupied from, uh, well, records show, first occupation was around 1237. Uh, the uh, oldest church also happens to be here. Uh, the oldest church is still in use, which is Maria Kirche or St. Mary's Church. Uh, there is another church, you look over here because of those guys, but it's, it's over there, you can't really see it. It's in a place called Nikolai Theater. Um, that has a school fresco called uh, The Dance of the Death. And no one knows who painted it, and no one knows when it was painted, but it's cool. What the Second World War, well, rather. Um, there was a lot of um, nice tall buildings here, like four or five story buildings right in the center of the city. This uh, Platz, the square, Alexander Platz, um, wasn't this broad and laid out. It was actually a much smaller affair. Um, but after the Second World War, instead of removing the rubble from the city, they just got lazy and said, right, just pave over it. So directly below us, there is at least a meter, sometimes more than more like two meters of uh, just houses, basically, rubble. Um, so one thing we do know about uh, Marion uh, with the red bricks is that they were inspiration for our next building here, Wolfgang's Rathaus. And most of you got out of the station road to Rathaus. This is German naming conventions 101. Basically, if it looks like something, just call it that. So Rotus Rathaus means uh, Red Town Hall. And uh, this will come up a lot uh, as we go along. Uh, so it's the, uh, the town hall, uh, it's the city hall. Um, uh, it's uh, where mayor works. We've got uh, our first uh, female mayor at the moment, Francesca Guti. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, we built it in uh, uh, 1869, which is a good two years before the foundation of Germany as a state. In 1969, and it was built by the, uh, by the communist government, the socialist government. Um, as a sign of uh, how strong the economy was and how good the engineering was and technology was in the East. And just kind of lord over the web. Uh, they couldn't stop it from falling over. So it's actually built by Swedes, uh, as much as uh, they say that the GDR will do. And um, so as we go along, um, please feel free to come up and ask me questions. Talk about the old museum first. You've probably seen it before. You've probably seen it in uh, photos of uh, Hippo, because um, he loved making speeches here. This was originally uh, uh, like a parade ground for uh, troops, uh, even back to Prussian towns. Um, so it was used for rally quite a lot during uh, the Nazi period. Um, but yeah, you can probably remember from the pictures like the uh, swastika is kind of unfurling down, uh, like these uh, banners here. Um, so that that's basically what it was used for. Um, uh, a little bit of a little bit of weird history. The, the bowl out the front, and uh, you can see it there, right, right next to the steps. And um, this, when it was constructed, was uh, the largest bowl in the world constructed out of a single piece of granite, which I guess was impressive back then. Um, but uh, uh, they actually made it to go inside uh, in the museum, um, but they built the museum uh, columns first, and so they couldn't get it in. So it just stayed out there. Uh, this was constructed by Kaiser uh, Wilhelm Friedrich. Uh, he was obsessed with making uh, Athens on the spree. So kind of like a, a capital city here that would rival uh, the, the other great cities of the world, like Moscow, uh, Rome, and uh, London. Um, but yeah, as you can see, uh, they're still working on it. It was uh, extensively damaged during the Second World War. And again, the communists, after the Second World War, they said, we don't want this massive cathedral in the center of our city. So they didn't knock it down, like they did with the Imperial Palace, but they just kind of said, you don't have to repair it either. So it actually only reopened in 2005. Russia was one of the main states that makes up uh, modern-day Germany. It uh, covered like a little bit of Poland, at one point it covered a bit of Austria, a bit of Denmark, uh, but Berlin was always the capital. 
Um, not always a couple, actually, but uh, uh, it was a couple from the accepted centre. Royal Iceland, so it was basically to protect the palace uh, just across the beach there. It is now home to the uh, German History Museum, which is fantastic. I, thought, I would say the best uh, museum in the city, but it's closed for renovation at the moment. <laughs> uh, so this is designed by Schindler. Um It was originally a, a guardhouse, uh, again, for the, for the local palaces. Uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, it became a memorial to those who had died in, in the Napoleonic Wars. After the First World War, uh, it became a monument to uh, those who died uh, uh, in all war. Uh, after uh, and the Nazis came to power, it became a monument to the victims of Bolshevism and militarism. When the communists took power, it was a monument to the victims of fascism and militarism. And then after reunification, it became uh, a monument to the victims of all war and tyranny. So they just basically were just like, give me this, give me this, give me this. It's everything now. It's the body of a concentration camp victim and an unknown soldier from uh, one of the battlefields and uh, interned them in there. The reason that is controversial is because they don't know if the soldier that they took was German. And the idea is that potentially they buried a concentration camp victim yeah and a fascist in the same place. So, I mean, it was a nice thought, but you know, it didn't really get through to practice. Um, inside is a statue by a woman called Kita Kolbitz. She's super famous uh, within um, Berlin. Um, she was a famous pacifist. She was uh, alive during the Second World War. She spoke out against the war, um, the war specifically, um, but uh, the fascists couldn't do anything about her because she was so beloved by uh, people of Berlin that they would have had a serious problem on their hands. Um, but uh, yeah, she was a, a major pacifist. Um, her son, unfortunately, wanted to help his countrymen. He was a doctor and he wanted to go off to war. Um, and he lasted three weeks before he was killed. Um, so they've used a statue of hers. It's, a, it's called a Pieta. Um, a Pieta, if any of you studied hard history, is a, 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 a woman crying over the body of her son. Uh, the most famous being uh, Mary and Jesus. Um, but uh, uh, this is Kita Kolvitz's one. Um, and it's secular. And it's. Um, She's crying over him and uh, she basically is shielding him from the elements because there's an oculus. There's a circle cut out of the ceiling yeah. and uh, it's quite cool uh, when it rains or snows or when the sun is directly overhead, she is still guarding his body and she's still kind of folding. Russian history in general. Uh, this area is definitely all about Frederick the Borsa, uh, Frederick the Great. Uh, that's him up on the statue there, up on the horse, uh, next to all the linden trees. Uh, so to understand him, I'm just going to go back to his father, uh, who's uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Friedrich. Everyone's a Friedrich. Um, and he fancied himself the soldier king. Um, he basically wanted to uh, obsess with war, the idea of war, the idea of conquering more lands. Um, Friedrich here uh, tried to escape to England when he was uh, only 18 years old. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he was betrayed and he was caught uh, and uh, uh, his father, Kaiser Wilhelm Friedrich, uh, executed him uh, with his own hand in front of uh, Friedrich. And now uh, you'd think that uh, that would mess Friedrich up and uh, probably did, but um, uh, it also made him uh, focus on uh, a different, being a different kind of person. Uh, so he wanted to concentrate on culture, on art, on education. Um, and he did that in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way that he did it was with the uh, Deutsche Staatsoper, uh, which is here behind you. Um, as you can see, it's pink because it's royal. But this is the first uh, uh, German naming convention, Deutsche Staatsoper, German State Opera House. That's it. Um, uh, this is the first State Opera House uh, in the world that wasn't connected to a, uh, a palace, uh, a royal residence. And he really wanted it to be for the people. Uh, he was a composer himself. Uh, he did, I think it's about eight operas, um, but a whole like 130 different marches, sonatas and things like this. Every time that he had one of his own operas on, uh, entry was completely free. You have to remember at that point, I mean, opera is so popular today, but opera back then was like Netflix. Like everybody wanted it. It was the only entertainment that you could get. So it was super, super popular. And yeah, it was free to get in if uh, it was uh, one of the Kaiser's own pieces, uh, the Humboldt University, um, which is main bases over here. 20,000 books here and then another 21 universities around the country and burned them outside in the, in the, uh, in the square. Um, what is, I mean, yeah, I, I've just said the Nazis came in and took the books. That's not actually true. What is true is that it was the students and the professors, the people who worked in the university and were studying there, they themselves were the ones who took the books. Um, and so kind of blaming it on an outside force is 
irresponsible. It was the students and the, and the teachers themselves. Just a bit sad. Um, so yeah, they took 20,000 books from here. Um, and it was basically, it was uh, anyone they disagreed with or anyone from a, a, a minority that they were persecuting already. So whether it was Jews, uh, homosexuals, uh, I mean, they were pretty broad about who they hated. Uh, so uh, there was yeah, a, a lot to choose from. After the, six, uh, the Thirty Years' War, um, uh, the population of Berlin had been decimated. Uh, they lost between uh, a quarter and a third of the population, uh, and they needed to repopulate, and they needed some, uh, some outside investors as well. Um, and they were migrating kind of around Europe, uh, setting up uh, little, uh, little colonies of French people. Um, and uh, they had money, uh, they were merchants, and they had skills uh, in between weaving. And so he basically said, you know what? Come to Berlin. We've got space for you. We've got a lot of space because a lot of people died. Um, and I tell you what, sweeten the deal. I'll build you a cathedral. So that's this one here. Now it's not the whole building. It's just the back section with the uh, the red tiles on top. Um, and then uh, obviously the uh, the Germans who were living here at the time were just kind of like, well, okay, you know, it's nice that you've uh, done something nice for these guys. We would also like something nice. So, bam, the back section of this one. Uh, was built for the uh, for the for the locals, the, the Lutherans. Um, and uh, about 100 years late, um, this is the uh, Deutsche Dom, and this is the Französische Dom, and German naming convention. This is the French cathedral and the German cathedral. That's literally that's just it. They're pretending that this little shed over here, that was Jack One Charlie. It's ridiculous. Jack One Charlie was huge. So it was called Jack One Charlie because uh, after um, the Alpha and Bravo, um, not because uh, it was named after a guy called Charlie. This gentleman is not Charlie. Okay. Uh, it was called Charlie because just it was the third one. The reason why uh, it's so famous and so important is because uh, it was the only uh, crossing which um, diplomats and uh, members of uh, the different armies would cross over. Uh, all the other uh, crossings were reserved for Germans only, um, so uh, East and West Germans uh, could cross over. This one was important because it was just for diplomats. Um, it's probably most famous because uh, of uh, an incident that happened in October 1961. It was all caused by a British diplomat uh, who had tickets for the opera uh, uh, in the Soviet sector. And uh, he uh, came to the checkpoint, he was late for the opera, and he didn't have his correct paperwork. And the Soviet guards, um, they could have been a bit nicer to him, but they sent him away. They said, no, you can't have access. Uh, this worked its way back to the uh, American uh, High Command, and uh, they thought that the Soviets had just unilaterally decided to close the border between the two sides. Um, and um, uh, so the, uh, the Americans sent two jeeps along. Of course, the Soviets answered with a different two jeeps. And then this escalated and escalated and escalated, and eventually you have 20 tanks on either side of Checkpoint Charlie. And they're facing down each other. And the only way to de-escalate that was to... Um, to and, and again, the Soviets actually took the first step again this time. They, um, they went back 10 meters, and then the Americans went back 10 meters, and then the Soviets another 10 meters. So it sounds like it was a pretty boring uh, uh, evening all in all, but it was also very, very close to nuclear war, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, just want to talk to you very briefly about uh, this guy. This is Jeff Harper. The, this, it, it's, a, it's an installation, it's art. He was actually in the city, um, but uh, he was just visiting. Um, he was stationed uh, elsewhere in West Germany. Um, the funny thing is, though, is that this has been up there for years, and uh, it was only a couple of years ago that one of Jeffy's friends uh, from the US was visiting the city and said, Jeff, did you know there's a giant poster of you in the center of Berlin? And he said, no, I didn't know that. Um, and uh, they've interviewed him since then, since they found out who he is. And uh, so did you kind of okay with it? He's like, yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to put my face there, that's totally fine. Wasn't there, but yeah, boom. <laughs> You have to remember the wall was built exclusively by uh, the East uh, German government. It wasn't built by the West German government. Um, West Berlin was just an island within East Germany. So they built the wall around West Berlin. It's not like a wall straight down the middle. They just encircled West Berlin in its entirety. Um, give you an example. This is the wall, okay? The other side there, that's the West, okay? 
So the, the East couldn't obviously build anything in uh, West German land. They could only build in their own land. So they did actually demolish things like um, demolish the church so that they could actually build their wall and so they could build a death strip. So the death strip had to be on the Eastern side. So that wall is basically, that's the border. Then you've got a death strip and then another wall. And in the death strip, they had things like uh, automated uh, 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 turrets. And they had uh, guard towers, uh, like uh, this one here, got a picture of it. Um, uh, they had uh, the mine part of it. Uh, they had just the spikes sticking out of the ground, like some cartoon villains. Um, but yeah, um, the death strip itself, uh, in some parts, was uh, close to half a kilometer in width. Uh, we're actually going to go to uh, what is probably the uh, thinnest part. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when we get there. Um, but yeah, um, they think uh, um, uh, it's approximately four or 5,000 people actually escaped, uh, either over or under the wall. Um, and uh, the number of people who were killed trying to make a crossing is approximately 150, but obviously uh, they were killed by the uh, East Germans and the East Germans didn't keep, uh, keep records or advertise that so many people were trying to escape. So the number is probably a lot higher. Here we are in front of the Berlin Wall. See um, the Berlin Wall. So now you're right in front of it. Where's the Berlin Wall? Happy enough? Yeah. Yeah. Can I tap it? Yeah, you don't touch it. You can reach it. <laughs> touch it down. Oh. There you go, you touch the burly mall. Yeah. Uh, Hitler's idea was that uh, it would be a thousand year fight. Uh, like a thousand years of, uh, of well, like, uh, Nazi control. And he uh, wanted buildings that would reflect. Um, so yeah, so obviously uh, wanted something that was going to last a thousand years, wanted something that was going to be really monumental, um, that was kind of going to stand the test of time, something that uh, archaeologists would look back on like uh, the Parthenon or the Colosseum and say, yeah, this was, this was a very important empire. Uh, so it's quite sturdy, quite brutalist, and um, yeah, just kind of exudes evil, basically. Um, uh, it managed to survive the entire Second World War without being bombed. Um, and it only came to light recently, actually, for uh, like why that uh, occurred. Um, and uh, it's because the RAF, uh, the British Air Force, um, specifically um, didn't want it bombed because it's so big. It was one of the biggest uh, offices in the world when it opened, uh, like 2,000 rooms. So big, it's easily identifiable from the air. And so they knew that if they could see this building, they would want to bomb around it because they knew that all the other ministry buildings are there. Now, super ironically, they didn't know what was housed in here. Uh, but what was housed in here was the Luftwaffe headquarters. So the German Air Force had their headquarters here. And ironically, the RAF was protecting them. Um, so they could have actually uh, destroyed the command structure of uh, the German Air Force themselves. And instead, they were like, no, it's actually just more useful to bomb around it. After, uh, the, uh, after the war was over, um, this was one of the main buildings that was still standing. Um, and so it was super useful to the uh, communist government uh, that moved in um, because they needed to run the country from somewhere. And so they took over this and it became the House of Ministries. Uh, so basically, all the ministries for uh, the East Germans which popped into this one building. It doesn't look that big from here, but it's going to take us a while to walk down the side of it. And it actually does go quite far this way as well. One of the more interesting things that happened during the communist period, uh, um, uh, up until the wall fell, was that um, uh, this... You remember the picture I showed you? The West Berlin is just over the wall there. This is the death strip. This is probably one of the more narrow sections of the death strip because it goes right up to the building and includes the building. Um, this whole area, you couldn't walk in because it was forbidden. You would have be assumed to be trying to escape from uh, from, uh, from the east. But uh, it's also the site of one of the most daring um, escapes from the east. Um, yeah, I said about 4,000, 5,000 people approximately uh, got through. Um, probably best examples of that are uh, Tunnel 26 and Tunnel 59. There's Tunnel numbers are not for like how many tunnels, it's how many people got through the tunnels. Um, but uh, yeah, there's also a whole host of other ways, uh, including um, uh, hot air balloons, uh, homemade hot air balloons, uh, uh, rafts, uh, just, just running. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the most uh, uh, daring ones was a guy called Per Holzapfel. Basically, Per Holzapfel was working with some of the ministries in here, and he would visit uh, a couple of times a, a week. Um, and so uh, when they were having an open, open day, basically, uh, where family members, friends could come in, could see where you where you work, see meet your colleagues, etc. He brought his family in here, and hid them in the bathrooms uh, um, until uh, after closing time. Uh, then he let himself out, 
and uh, made their way up to the roof, to, uh, to this corner, actually, over here, behind the tree, uh, where he had uh, he already warned his uh, family and his wife's family um, that uh, they were planning this, and they were waiting on the other side of the wall, uh, just kind of where the topography of terrorists were. So he had a hammer connected to uh, like a piece of cord, swung that over, and they, would, they held it tight on the other side, the ground level. And then he had constructed harnesses out of old uh, car seatbelts, um, and uh, uh, he uh, sent his uh, his ten year old son across first uh, on a basically a zip line going from the roof over the wall down the other side. Uh, it was about this time that they were spotted by the border guards. Um, now the border guards saw what was happening and they said, "No way, no way is someone escaping from the House of Ministries, like the center of our government." across the wall. That's just ridiculous. This must be the Stasi, the, uh, the East German secret police. It must be them conducting an exercise of some kind. So we're just going just gonna to watch him. We're going to ignore him. Uh, it was only after his wife got across safely again. Um, and then uh, it was her whole for himself. It was his turn. And he strapped himself into his seatbelts, got on his zip line, and he got nearly all the way over and dropped his briefcase. At which point this, uh, the border guards were like, hang on a second. These people are actually escaping. That's ridiculous. And so it started opening fire. Now, her holds up. Thankfully, did actually make it to the other side. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a bit touch and go there for a while. Uh, Eight point five meters below us uh, currently. Now, the bunker itself wasn't uh, always um, just underground. It was uh, above ground as well. It covered this whole area. These apartment blocks are obviously uh, from uh, from the nineteen seventies. Um, but yeah, um, the Hitler bunker uh, was a huge operation. Uh, I mean, most of the big shots, the head honchos at that time did have their own bunkers, Churchill that is in London. Uh, but yeah, Hitler's was here. Uh, this whole area was actually, um, uh, uh, again, like similar to the, the, the Luftwaffe building that we already passed by, that massive one. Um, this was all uh, German ministry buildings and army buildings uh, at that time. Uh, Hitler went into the bunker uh, in January of 1945. And he very rarely came up afterwards. Uh, the last footage of him is actually from his birthday, which would have been April uh, 1945, 20th of April. Um, and uh, uh, the, yeah, the footage of him is a, a very old, sickly man, uh, clearly on a lot of drugs. And um, he's uh, uh, pinning uh, medals on uh, children, on old men, and on those who'd already been injured in battle, and sending them back out to fight the uh, Red Army, which was rapidly approaching uh, from, from the east. Um, uh, one of the last things that he did before he died was he um, uh, he wrote a last will and testament. Um, but this was kind of a two-sided thing. Basically, one side was basically uh, telling the German people that they had let him down. He was a bit rich considering the damage that he did to their country. Um, but yeah, basically he said he was kind of saying, uh, "You were my chosen people. You were meant to rule the world, and you let me down. You disappointed me." And I don't think anyone really cares what you think anyway. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing that was stipulated in that will was what to be uh, what would, was to be done with his body uh, after he died. Um, he'd seen what happened to Mussolini uh, in uh, Milan. Uh, Mussolini uh, <laughs> was uh, well, he was dragged through the street naked, strung up outside the uh, Grand Hotel, and used as target practice. Wow. And Hitler said, kind of like, you know, actually, maybe I don't want that to happen. I know I'm going to die, but I prefer not, that not to happen. So he had very specific instructions about how his body was meant to be uh, disposed of. Um, and so then uh, he got married to his longtime girlfriend, uh, Eva Braun. Um, no one's really sure why they did it. He wasn't a religious guy at all, uh, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, every, the theory is that she was the one who kind of pressured him into uh, getting married uh, before they died. Um, he then took a cyanide pill. Uh, um, and he was super paranoid that his cyanide pills had been replaced with uh, sleeping pills by British uh, secret agents and that he was going to wake up in uh, custody. Um, so he also shot himself. Now. He probably could have just shot himself, <laughs> but I'm, you know, it's it's killing Hitler, so I'm not really uh, not going to argue with the guys. Um, and uh, Eva uh, was shot as well. Um, then uh, their bodies were brought upstairs uh, by the few remaining officials uh, who were still in the bunker. Um, they were put in a shallow grave and they tried to burn the bodies. Now I'm not sure if any of you guys have burned a body before, but uh, it takes a super high temperature and it takes a, a super long time uh, to do it uh, because you do it properly. Hot chips. Um, yeah, right. Sounds like cool. um, should change how I say that. Um, but uh, uh, you have to remember, at that point in time, the entire city was uh, in, in flames. And it caused a really weird uh, uh, environmental issue. Basically, all the oxygen is sucked out of the air by the other main fires. So they couldn't light a small fire to burn Hitler's body. So they managed to get it uh, like lightly crispy. Um, and then they just covered it over. And they all left. 
And the Red Army, when they arrived, um, they said, they found the bodies and they said, there's no way that's Hitler. There's no way they would just leave Hitler slightly crispy in a, like a shallow grave and then just leave. Is it going to rain? Um, uh, such a, um, uh, so they kept looking for him for a further four days. Um, and it was only after that time that they went, they, you remember the concert house from earlier? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the last, well, they thought that that building was still standing. They were like, bet Hitler's in there. No, he was in the ground. So the, the Red Army came back and said, actually, that is Hitler. So they tracked down his dentist. His dentist was dead. They tracked down his dentist's assistant. They dragged this guy over here and they said, look at his teeth. Is that Hitler? And uh, yeah, that's how his body was initially identified by the Red Army. Now, since then, he's been identified a number of other ways, including DNA tests. Uh, until recently, his jawbone was actually kept in a, a secret place in Moscow. Um, and only recently was that uh, uh, destroyed. Um, but basically, the ashes were then uh, spread in the, uh, the river uh, Elba. The, ma the main part of the ashes were spread in the river Elba in order to not give uh, the, uh, any neo-Nazis or fascists um, somewhere that they could go and, uh, and congregate and kind of have as a memorial uh, to him. Uh, which is quite interesting about this place, because as you can see, there is no signage around here. There's nothing to say this is where the, uh, the bunker was, which is, again, Germany reflecting on itself. Um, when the bunker was, uh, the, the top level was destroyed, they didn't have the option to destroy the bottom level because it would have brought all the buildings around it down on top of it. Berlin is basically a swamp. So they sealed it up and they said, okay, in 50 years time, we're going to look at this again and we're going to figure out what we're going to do, do with this. 1995 rolls around and they said, no, we're still not ready. We still haven't figured out what we're going to do with it. And uh, yeah, now it's 2022 and they still haven't decided. It's still down there waiting uh, for potentially like to be destroyed or to be used as a museum in the future. Who knows? But right now, no one wants to talk about it. Just let it lie. Um, the buildings around it, uh, these are from the 70s, they're from the, uh, the communist period. Um, really weirdly, these were built as kind of the VIP uh, accommodation for members of the, uh, the uh, uh, East German state. So like famous uh, actors, actresses, uh, sports personalities, politicians sort of lived in here. Right. Why? Because they look right over the wall to Western. <laughs> it's actually nicer. Um, but yeah, so if you, if you destroyed the, uh, the bunker as it stands right now, these buildings would probably come around, uh, come down with them. Um, but yeah, so the German government refuses to spend money on this area and refuses to kind of create any memorial of any kind. That didn't stop a sign eventually being put up, and that was only recently. The World Cup was held here, and uh, visitors from around the world kept ringing on the doorbells of all the people who lived around here saying, oh. is this Hitler's house? Uh, so the people who live here got together, and they put up a sign. It's just over here. And it's just a very simple sign, and it's the only thing that's been put up, and that's, that only went up in 2005. I'm really sorry, it's raining. <laughs> um, don't worry, we've only got about two more stops to go. One thing I would like to say to you guys is... Um, just keep in mind kind of what kind of memorial this is and uh, what kind of memorial the next one is. Holocaust Memorial, right? Actually, more correctly, this is the, the memorial to the murdered Jews of yours. Uh, it's not just for the Holocaust that happened during World War II, uh, it's for everything that's happened before and after. So it's everyone, it's up to you to interpret it how you will. Um, I know how I interpret it, and I know how uh, uh, other tourists have told me they uh, interpret it. And it's just, it's a personal experience for everyone. So yeah, head on in. Thousand seven hundred and eleven pages in the Babylonian Talmud, the uh, uh, Jewish holy book. Um, but uh, the original design of the uh, memorial was actually meant to be much, much bigger. So I think that point is kind of moot. Um, there's also the uh, interpretation that uh, these resemble the graves in uh, the Prague Jewish uh, cemetery, where the uh, bodies were buried on top of each other. And so they kind of come up and go. I don't think that's it either. Um, Eisenman has been really coy about uh, explaining uh, his reasoning behind uh, uh, the, the, the monument. Recognize Brandenburg Gate, Brandenburg Tor. It's kind of 
symbol of the divided city um, because where we're standing right now was in the death strip in no man's land and the wall it, like the death strip basically went until the tree line here and then to about 100 meters on the other side of the gate so the gate was in the middle of it you couldn't get access to the gates but it also meant that the parliament building was in, in theory was in west berlin but uh, the obviously the, the west german government did not want to use a parliament building it was right next to the wall it seemed to be ridiculous. So they actually moved um, the entire government down to Bonn, further south in uh, West, uh, West Germany. Um, it was only after reunification that they started work on um, uh, renovating the Reichstag building um, uh, so it could be used again as their parliament for the whole country. Um, they put in, uh, instead of the original dome, they put in a glass dome. Um, it's quite cool. It is impossible to get a ticket for it unless you've already booked. Um, it yeah. is free though. You got it? Yeah. Five days. Nice work. Um, yeah, I went during Corona times and I thought it was super easy to get in there. Apparently, there's a lot more tourists now, um, like you. Um, but yeah, it's quite cool. You can go up the outside of the dome and see the whole city. But it's also got a, a glass uh, floor, so you can actually see the parliament at work below you. The idea being that the people are above the parliament. People are monitoring the work of the parliament. Or, or not like um, but yeah, uh, we'll just sniff over the other side and have a better look of uh, the... Um, this is Brandenburg Gate. Brandenburg Gate was actually named after Brandenburg the town. So way, 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 way back when uh, Berlin was uh, just a, a small gathering uh, of, uh, of, of people, let's say. Um, Brandenburg the town, which is a straight shot up that way, gave it permission to be a city. And so Brandenburg Gate uh, became like the, the, the joining place between the two uh, the two towns. Um, uh, over the years, obviously, it gained importance. Uh, Berlin became a lot more important than Brandenburg, and uh, but the gate is still called Brandenburg Gate. Uh, originally, it was just there to collect taxes uh, from people who were arriving in the city. Um, uh, then it was turned into the monstrosity that you see before you. This uh, was um, it was back then. There was only uh, eight or nine eight um, uh, entrances to the city, main entrances. The Driga, the four horses there. Um, they were heavily damaged during the Second World War and only one of the horses had survived, but they found the original casts uh, for the horses and so they recreated the whole thing. And the lady behind the horses that's driving the carriage, uh, back when this was originally constructed, that was, uh, um, it, was it was a period of uh, like 25 years of peace in Berlin, which at that time was unheard of. So they were like, wow, we're doing so well. I've just finished our free walking tour with Walkative Tours. And it was very good. The guide was very informative. And like I said in my previous videos, although it's a free walking tour, they do expect tips. So we did 10 euros each, so a total of 30 euros for our walking tour this morning. We saw lots of sights and we enjoyed ourselves, especially Matthew, because he's really into his World War II history. Now we're going to go over to the Reichstag because we've got tickets to climb right to the very top of the dome. And that starts at 1.30. So let's head over there, shall we? We have just picked up our Berlin welcome cards for the Tourist Information Centre here. What these basically mean is we've got free transportation on all public transport, the bus, the train system. It also allows us free entry into certain museums, discounts in a number of other museums, and also discounts in selective restaurants as well. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Visit Berlin for providing these to us complimentary so we can enjoy the city of Berlin. Thank you very much. Uh, they also provide you with a guidebook as well with all the discounts you can receive with maps etc in there so there's a lot of things you can use with the welcome card the berlin welcome card again very appreciative to visit berlin for providing us with these welcome cards
we've made it to the top of the Reichstag building. This is a new addition, this glass dome. So we climbed all the way up the glass dome. Obviously, originally, this was a concrete dome that was destroyed at the end of the Second World War. Probably the Reichstag is most famous for being burnt down in the 1920s that Hitler accused the communists of doing, but that information is a bit iffy. And then obviously at the end of the Second World War, or near the end of the Second World War, there's those iconic shots of the Soviets storming the building and raising the Soviet flag at the Reichstag, pretty much ending the Second World War for Germany. Because the Soviets and then later the Allied forces, the Americans and the British, overrun Germany and we, we basically won. So we've been to the top of the dome, we're now going to walk back down and explore the roof terrace. I believe there might be a cafe as well, but we'll see when we get there. These mirrors here reflect the light down into the uh, parliamentary building below, so it's all lit by natural lighting reflected from the dome down into the building down there. We've seen all we need to see on the top of the Reichstag, so we're now going to head down and try and find somewhere for some lunch. Bratwurst in a bun. Mafia has got bratwurst and chips. And I've got bratwurst and chips as well. And I can see it going everywhere. We've had some lunch of some bratwurst and some pommes, as in chips. Now we're going to walk under the Brandenburg Gate and head towards the Museum Island. And the first museum we've got for today is the News Gallery which I believe is where the bust of Nefertiti is uh, housed. So that should be pretty interesting. you exit via the gift shop like every major attraction. We've just finished in the News Museum, I think that's how you pronounce it, News, N-E-U-S. Um, it was really interesting, if you're into Egyptology, it's the perfect museum in Berlin to go to. Most famous, like I mentioned earlier, for ne the bust of Nefertiti. There was actually no photography allowed in the room where Nefertiti's bust is, but strangely you're allowed to take a picture from the room opposite, which, what's the point of having no photography? <laughs> if you can do it just from outside the doorway. Anyway, we're off to the DDR museum now. It's about a five, six minute walk. We're on the way, we're gonna stop for a drink because we are so thirsty. Ollie's gone for a new strawberry. Matt, I've got chocolate. And I've got her Amarillo. <laughs>
today we've just been to the DDR Museum and probably only spent about 15, 20 minutes in there max. It wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, which is fine, but um, when I quickly looked up what we should be doing, um, it was about what it was like living in communist East Germany. And I suppose it did, it showed like living rooms, kitchens, bedrooms and things, but I thought there'd be a bit more things to do with like the military and things. But if you are interested in coming, you can use your Berlin welcome card, which we did, and we got a substantial discount off the entry. I think it was either 25 or 50% off. So if you are going to come to the DDR Museum, make sure you use your Berlin welcome card and you'll get a decent discount to enter. came to Checkpoint Charlie this morning on our guided walking tour we didn't actually get a chance to actually go to like that area there we just viewed it from by here across the road so we're gonna go over there now and take a look around I think so you've been to the fake Checkpoint Charlie now mm -hmm. you just got our stereotypical tourist photo outside Checkpoint Charlie and this is it now. Uh, some Trabants if we wanted to, but I don't think we will. We're only here till tomorrow. Thinking that the next time me and Matthew and maybe Holly comes to Berlin, we might rent one of these to drive around in. Maybe. Maybe. We're now going to head to the Topography of Terror, which is the former SS and Gestapo building. It's now become a museum and a show space to basically show how bad those kind of guys were. So we're going to take a look now. The guide we had this morning recommended it. So I can't tell you exactly what it is yet because I don't properly know. But as soon as we're there, we'll explore and we'll find out together, shall we? just finished visiting the Topographies of Terror Museum. The guide this morning recommended it to us. It's free of charge and I can thoroughly recommend it as well. It goes via timeline from the beginning of the fascist state in the early 1930s and continues up until the 2000s. Okay, we're back in the hotel. Sorry about that. The batteries on the camera run out. All four batteries we've gone through today. So we've come back to the hotel to recharge them. I've actually switched cameras to a different one as well, which I wasn't carrying around earlier. So as I was mentioning, the uh, Topography of Terror Museum was recommended to us by our guide this morning. And I have to admit, it's probably the best museum we went to today. We really enjoyed it not just because it was free of charge entry which is also good but it just basically followed the history of the rise of the nazi party up until early 2000s when the last ones were actually being prosecuted so starting off in the 1920s and 30s with the weimar republic so i say it matthew yeah weimar republic and then obviously the atrocities that the ss and the gestapo made during the second world war so the building itself was actually the headquarters of the of the gestapo and ss obviously that was destroyed but it's a new building put on the side of it now on the site of it now go through the whole timeline as i mentioned 
up until the prosecution. So original ones in the Euroburg trials in the 40s, um, later on when other Nazis were being captured, um, they were included up until the last one, I believe, was 2004, where a Nazi had been prosecuted for killing some Italian people, uh, prisoners of wars during the war in Italy. But yeah, I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it to anybody that um, is interested. It's literally just around the corner from Checkpoint Charlie. So it's three minutes walk from Checkpoint Charlie. So anybody that goes to the Checkpoint, Checkpoint Charlie, said it that time, uh, just walk down the street a bit further and you will get to it. It's right by a section of the Berlin Wall, which is still intact. Also, if you're wondering why Daddy sometimes asks now, if you like, is that correct, right? Like German things, because Snappy knows some German. Yeah, um, I know like about three words in German. Cat's there, that is cat. Um, hello, I think. Yeah, hello, something like that. That is hello. I know ja, I think it's ja, is it ja? Ja for yes and nine for no. That's the first German word I knew because, yeah, I just knew what that word was in German before and after even started learning. I just knew what nine was in German. And I think we're going to go out now and get some dinner, then return back to the hotel, settle in for the night, get stuff ready, because tomorrow we're going to Amsterdam on the train, and that's about six and a half hour train. So we want to get an early night and relax a bit. So yes, we're going out for our dinner now. Hopefully there's a lot of restaurants in the area, so we'll find something we like. Fingers crossed. This is a Pepsi and Fanta mix called yeah, I Fezzy. Like, I like Fanta and I don't know if I like Pepsi. I don't think I've ever tried that one. I've tried most soft drinks like Fanta, Coke, Sprite, 7-Up, Dr. No, not Dr. Pepper, uh, Mountain Dew. But I've never tried this. Yeah. That. Anyway, though. <laughs> Very fizzy. I think Matthew liked it. It tastes okay, it's just very fizzy. We've had our dinner and we can see a McDonald's just ahead of us there, so we're just going to get some McFlurries or a Sunday as a bit of a dessert. And then we'll head back to the hotel and then we'll settle in for the night. We'll see you there in a minute. We've just got some McFlurries for our dessert and we're heading back to the hotel. We've had our dinner, we've had our ice cream and now we're back at the hotel. We're getting ready for bed because we're quite tired so I think we're going to end this video here. Once again, I'd like to thank Visit Berlin for providing the Welcome to Berlin cards. They were really useful for getting around the city and also some discounts at the museums that we visited. And all that's left to do is... Holly, do you have a message for everybody? Yeah. If you like this video, please remember to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell button. Bye! Bye! <laughs> Next time on Travel Shorts Epic European Adventure.